السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد uh, thank you uh, my dear brothers and sisters for joining us today on the 12th of December and we have a wonderful program we'll get uh, straight into it alhamdulillah we are fortunate to have uh, Dr. Sabil once again uh, the founder of Gain Peace the director uh, founder of Gain Peace uh, he will be talking about the etiquettes of a caller or the dai the etiquettes of the dai alhamdulillah uh, Dr. Sap will be talking for about 25 30 minutes and then after that we will have about 20 25 minutes of questions and answer without further ado I will uh, hand it over to the doctor. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmaina ma ba'd. Wa naudu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri, wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qali. Everyone, Jazakallah Khairan for joining. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. About uh, eight months ago, I arrived to give a Juma khutbah at the Ikna Center in uh, Chicago. I came at uh, one o'clock. The prayer or the khutbah starts at 1.05. So I was quickly rushing from the car to the door, front door. And in came, I saw a non-Muslim brother who I kind of know I met him one or two times. He also started to walk in into the main door. I was presently surprised. So I asked uh, Mike, you know, Mike, it's good to see you. Uh, welcome to the Friday prayer and the Friday sermon. Uh, and Mike said, yes, you know, I came here and uh, today I'm coming to embrace Islam. Allah Akbar, right? So I was really surprised. And uh, then I gave the Juma khutbah and the Friday prayer was done. And Mike was sit sitting and he was listening. So after the, after the prayer, I called Mike in the front and Alhamdulillah in front of everyone, Mike took his Shahada. So one of the questions which I asked, uh, usually asked the new Muslim brothers and sisters is, you know, what teachings of Islam attracted you the most? But what aspect of Islam or Muslims attracted you the most? So now today, Alhamdulillah, you are here to embrace Islam. And this is what Mike said. Mike mentioned that, you know, he lives in front of the mosque, the masjid, and next to him is a Muslim neighbor. And Mike is a carpenter, he's a handyman. So he said that he often gets projects from the Muslims, especially from the Muslim neighbor. And he praised the Muslim neighbor saying that, you know, he gives me my amount right away. He doesn't bargain with me too much to bring it down too much. And he, uh, and he is wonderful neighbor. So the attributes of this Muslim neighbor attracted Mike to such a degree that Mike started to think, you know, who are these people? Who are these people or who is this family? What is the faith of their? So Mike started to come to the Ikna Center. I had and other people, we had long sessions with him about Islam, about Muslims, the theology and the guidance. And that is what led Mike, alhamdulillah, with Allah's guidance to come that day and to embrace Islam. So it's important for us, you know, many a times we emphasize so much about, uh, so much about the tough questions, easy answers, how to respond to them. We emphasize so much about, you know, the big projects that we need to have. We, we plan and we invest so much. We need to continue all of them, but at the most fundamental level, it's so important for us to have those attributes of a da'i, which is going to attract, which are going to attract those non-Muslims by our good deeds, with our smile, with our softness, with our kindness, with our relief and helping other people. All of these are as much and perhaps more important initially to attract the person towards Islam. So this is not just uh, by experience and by knowledge I'm saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ahzab, ayah number 21. Right? A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. So mentioning about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
لقد كان لكم في رسول الله اسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخرة وذكر الله كثيرا that in the person of Muhammad peace be upon him you have the best example to follow for those who believe in Allah in the last day and remembers Allah much so when we look at the Prophet's example we obviously we know that he's been called as the Sadiq and Alameen even before you know when he received the wahi he came to his wife Khatija anha, and he needed comfort he needed support and she mentioned that Allah is not going to disown you because you are good to your guest. You are good to the orphans, the widows. You are good to the people all around you. So Allah is not going to disown you. So even before he received the revelation, he had those uh, wonderful attributes that attracted the people as a magnet. So when the Wahi came, when he went to Mount Safa, when he called the people and he asked them, would you believe in me if I say that there is an army behind the mountain? They all said yes. Because they never saw him lie, they never heard him lie, and he was the most honest, the most truthful. So in Dawa, it's having credibility in the society, being known as a truthful person in the society, and being known as a credible person in the society, is as much important as the message that we need to deliver. So when we look at the history, by the way, these are the three maps. I could have many, many maps, many, many countries, but these are just the three regions around the world. So when we look into the 7th century, 8th, 9th, 10th century, in these three regions, so the map over here, the yellow one, this obviously is the East Africa. Then you can have the West Africa, and this is Indonesia, then you have Malaysia. When we look at these maps, not a single Muslim army initially went to these regions. When Islam started to spread, it was not, you know, some army came to occupy and to open the doors for Islam, unlike, you know, maybe India, unlike some other regions. In these regions, just the common people like you and me, they came there, they went there as business people, trade people, just being there, right, in a new country. And then they were identified as Muslims, as credible people and honest people when they do the interactions. And slowly that attracted the natives. And slowly, alhamdulillah, these traders, these businessmen, they started to share Islam. People ask about Islam. And now we know, alhamdulillah, the rest is history. This would never have happened, by the way. Just imagine Indonesia. There are 200 million Muslims in Indonesia. Just imagine if Muslims were just like everyone else, or if they were dishonest, or people of not of credibility, not only people will not look at them or ask them about their faith, actually if they found out that they belong to the Islamic faith, they would move away from Islam. So Alhamdulillah, we learn from the history that you know, it is our ancestors with their credibility and honesty and good trade practices, how Islam spread to literally millions and millions of people. The quotation that you see up over here are, these are the Christians from Jordan who are inviting the Muslims and saying to the Muslims that, you know, so this is the quotation, by the way, important for us to read, that, oh, Muslims, we prefer you over the Byzantines though they are of our own faith because you keep better faith with us and are more merciful to us and refrain from doing to us injustice and your rule over us is better than theirs for they have robbed us of our goods and our homes so it was the akhlaq of the people our muslims our ancestors the sahaba and the tabain and the taba tabain so non-Muslims, they literally used to come, they literally used to contact the Muslim rulers and invite them to rule over, over the non-Muslims. Because Muslims are better rulers, they deal people with justice. Right? So this is a historical fact, by the way, so it's really important for us. When we look at how Islam spread in the past, it is by the good conduct of people, the good words, the good packaging of the message, all of them initially attracted people to Islam. And then obviously, yes, 
more dais and more preachers they spread out to convey the message then mashallah in small cities and states and different countries that's how islam started to you know uh, get its roots so what are some of the attributes that we can extract from the prophet's life that the quran mentioned that he is the best example to follow so we can inculcate so inshallah allah can also bless us by attracting people towards us to find out ab about our faith so what are some of those attributes you know there are so many juma khutbas that people mention about these attributes many webinars and many sessions in our conventions so obviously having empathy on people is so important having credibility sound aqeedah is important by the way if we don't have the sound aqeedah nothing else matters then obviously patience is uh, one of the most important attributes personally if i have to choose the top five attributes of all the attributes patience would be in the top five believe me you know in the field of dawa as muslims especially living in this country if we lose the patience and uh, just you know become angry and emotional at people who may not look into islam the right way or say nasty things about islam that means we are shutting the doors between us and them you know uh, i mean so many stories inshallah maybe later on i can share some stories you know wisdom is also really important by the way as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wa ma'izatil hasanati wa jadil hum billati hiya ahsan surah 16 ayah number 125 the reason wisdom is important is because when we take the calls both gain peace and vice law it's important for us to use the right choice of words not to overwhelm the people if they ask us about islam or the quran about the prophet we don't want to overwhelm them with too much so one quick story i can uh, remember back in the school days i used to in between the semesters i used to work at motorola you know they used to make those uh, small phones that start the start tech phones i believe the clamshell phones so i was in the assembly line in my break uh, summer break in school next to me alhamdulillah i found out the person is a christian and he became interested in islam you know after i broke the ice with him and what not so as soon as i saw that he's interested in islam when i went home that day i went to the internet and i printed like maybe 50 pages of information about islam about the prophet about allah subhanahu wa taala about the quran about the miracles about salvation i literally printed 50 plus pages and i gave to him the next day and i was thinking that he would be overjoyed so he took the pages and then the next day the next week the next month i kept on asking the person you know uh, john have you read the the material which i gave you and john kept on saying you know i did not get a chance to come back to those pages so then later on i realized that i overwhelmed john with too much information information overload i was not using my wisdom by the way so that was to be like in school so wisdom means that we just mention enough information to the level of the person proper packaging proper evidence but just making the person curious and let them ask questions once they ask questions inshallah they'll be more receptive obviously good character honesty truthfulness all of these are important right non argumentative but there are other attributes uh, i want to highlight in the next slide then i will and with that then i would like to open any questions and, and floor for any questions inshallah so the attributes which i would say are equally important if not more would be these attributes and unfortunately these attributes are hardly mentioned in our juma khutbas or in our webinars or in our you know conventions in our halaqas ikna halaqa we hardly touch upon these by the way 
But all of these are equally part of the sunnah as eating with our right hand, saying Bismillah. Having good health for a da'i for every Muslim is important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the blessings of our health. We cannot accomplish the, the obligation of dawa if our health is compromised with high blood pressure and cholesterol and insulin and many problems. Yes, we do our best what we can. Anything that happens, we say Alhamdulillah. But at least we have to try from our own side, from our own self. The choices that we make, we have to be healthy, right? I mean, obviously, we all know the many ahadiths of the Prophet ﷺ. In one of the authentic, authentic narration, the Prophet said that the worst vessel a person can fill would be their own stomach. If they, if you have to eat, eat only small portions. But if you have to eat more, then eat one third, and leave the second third for drink, and the third third leave it empty for just ease of breathing and being active. So that one third is not the minimum, by the way, the one third is the maximum, right? It's important. So having a good health is part of being a Muslim. It is one of the sunnahs of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Having good communication skills is also part of the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Being a good communicator means not only we say what needs to be said. We need to be, we need to listen. A good communicator also has good listening skills, right? So communication is a two-way street. So us being a good listener is also part of the communication. So in our Desi culture, I'm not sure about Arab culture, or African culture. In our Desi culture, unfortunately, it's really, uh, uh, you know, we can see in an obvious way that people interrupt each other. Suppose if somebody is talking, you know, a desi brother, desi sister, maybe myself, right? We interrupt the person before the person finishes the sentence. Also, good communication skills means that we need to avoid as many filler words when we speak. You know, the ah, uh, the um, you know, so, uh, you like. All of these are filler words, by the way. It's annoying when I hear filler words. And maybe people get annoyed when they hear filler, filler words from me. So I'm not sure if I mentioned this uh, last time. So these two kids, they went to the Juma Khutbah, right? A six-year-old kid and a 10-year-old kid. Their mom sent them, okay, fine. Our house is close by. Why don't you guys walk up? and attend the Friday prayer. So they both went there and the younger kid, he started to play around with a friend that he found in uh, the masjid. And the older kid, he was more serious, more knowledgeable, and he kept on saying to the younger kid that, you know, this is the Friday khutbah, the Friday sermon going on. Do not talk, do not play, do not make noise. And the younger kid said, but why not? So the older kid said that if you make too much noise, you're going to wake up the people. All right. So, mashallah, many of our khatibs are really good and dynamic and good communication skills. But some khatibs, some of our presenters, that may include me too, by the way, I'm not saying I'm good, bad, that you're okay or not. I'm saying that every single one of us we have an excellent message, the best message that anyone can ever give to anybody. Allah gave the best message, message of Islam to us. It's a blessing. And he appointed us and he honored us to share the blessing with others. And the best way to share this is through our communication skills. That means our communication skills has to be at the same level as the best message that Allah has given to us. So that itself should move us and persuade us and encourage us and challenge us to improve our communication skills. So I'm going to encourage all of you, including myself, to take classes, maybe in the local public library, maybe in the local college, perhaps the Toastmaster, which I mentioned last time too, I believe, to improve our communication skills. Believe me, it will have such a big impact, inshallah, on our 
delivery of the message on the recipients, inshallah. Knowledge of the world is so important, by the way. And the reason is that I would say we have to get involved with our colleagues. It doesn't matter what conversation that they're having. The more time that we get involved with our colleagues on any conversation, the more the chances of us mentioning about spirituality, about Islam, about Muslims, or any conversation will come up in which they will become curious to ask us about Islam. That will only happen if we start the conversation or if we join the conversation, any conversation, by the way. And for us to be a good participant of a, any conversation, we have to have knowledge not just of Islam, not just of comparative religion. We also have to have knowledge of the world, the politics, the economy, maybe the weather, maybe the sports, maybe the movies. Not that you have to see the movies to have the knowledge, but at least we should be aware what is the pulse of the society. So it's a good idea for us to listen to the news or to browse the news. USA Today app, you know, Yahoo or CNN, the, you know, knowledge is everywhere, by the way. So becoming knowledgeable about the world is also really, really important for us to break the ice and start conversations. Time management is important, by the way. I mean, I don't have to dwell too much on it, but time management is uh, important because you know, when we do our ICNA meetings or board meetings, many a times we start late and we finish late. Time is a commitment that Allah has given to us between us and people that are involved with us. But could be any organization, any school, maybe at work. So time management is quite important by the way. Event management, just to make the most out of the events, it is also part of Part of the sunnah to have good project management skills. You know, just a simple example is that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was an excellent, the best project manager, by the way. And why do I say that? You know, when we just take into account just one aspect of the Prophet's life, the time of the Hijrah from Makkah to Medina in the year 622, the planning that he did before even he started the Hijrah, the companion that he chose and the day of the week and the time of the day that he left Mecca and, uh, and, and the route that he take, by the way, it was not a conventional route and the cave that he chose and the time that he stayed in the cave and the nourishment, who is going to bring the nourishment to Abu Bakr Siddiq and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the cave. And then from there, as they left again for uh, for Medina, which route for them to take, where they should be stopping before they go there. And once he go, went to Medina, before he went to Medina itself, how he sent the ambassador, ambassadors of Islam, especially the main one, uh, Musa bin Umair, and the others. So he made Medina ready for him. So the whole event of Hijrah is an excellent example of project management. So having good project management skills is as much part of the sunnah as eating with our right hands by saying Bismillah. Marketing skills, you know, holding effective meetings, balancing family and dawa. So all of these, mashallah, we can go into detail. So what I would do is, inshallah, I'm going to stop over here by just mentioning that Alhamdulillah, with all the wonderful projects that we do on behalf of ICNA National, on behalf of Why Islam and Gain Peace and Relief and Helping Hands and ILF, Sisters and Youth, all the projects, we need some fuel for the projects. And the fuel for the projects is having the right aqidah and good character. So I hope and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase in our good aqidah, in our good character. So any project that we do, we pray that Allah will accept it and it will have an impact on the recipients. Ameen. Jazakallah khairan. I will stop now. I will open the floor for any questions that you may have, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you very much.
Um, someone was asking, can, can you um, on take, out, take me up the speaker? Yes, brother, go ahead. What about the simplicity in the message? Yes, yes. So, so that's really important, by the way. Uh, simplicity in uh, the message is quite important. You know, many a times uh, what we have seen is sometimes we assume that people may know a lot more than actually they do. Number one. So we, we don't want to assume anything. We want to make sure that we simplify the message and we start with the really basic uh, to the level of the person. And even when we start with the basic, by the way, what I would advise to myself and all of you, as I have done in the last class, our center, our focus of the main message should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the message of Tawheed. Who is the creator? Who is not the creator? What is the purpose of life? What is the, what is the study guide that Allah has given to us so we can pass the exam in this life? And what would be the what would be the incentive that Allah will give to us, inshallah, once we graduate from this life? So simplicity is re really important, and the and the focus of the may, of focus of our discussion should be the oneness and the guidance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So I would say that that's also a good uh, attribute for a Muslim to inculcate and to follow and practice that not to make our our message complicated but package it to such a way that we don't overwhelm the person we keep it simple our focus should be the oneness of allah and giving them only enough to make them curious so they keep on asking questions and then when we respond to them they will be more receptive inshallah i thank you very much um doc someone wanted to know um about if they have um you know some anxiety speaking to people how, how do you overcome that? And can maybe, can you speak a little bit more about the Toastmaster? And and is it like, is it open? Can anyone join anywhere? What? Okay, so the question is about anxiety, right? Yes. If a person has anxiety, what uh, should uh, a person do? I would say that, uh, I mean, obviously we should do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that Musa alayhi salam, did the dua right so this is in surah taha so musa salam also had a speech impediment so before he went to fir'aun to deliver the message he did the dua, dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli so the dua is basically to uh, to make fir'aun receptive and to remove the impediment from musa salam's uh, you know speech so it will have an impact on the recipient. So it's always good idea to do the dua either, you know, audibly or obviously in our hearts, right? That's number one. Number two, what I have seen, okay, so I also am quite nervous, by the way, before I start a speech. But what calms me down is the fact that if I prepare myself good, then I'm much, much calmer compared to if I have not prepared myself. So preparation uh, and knowing the material good uh, is uh, one of the ways to reduce anxiety, right? So that's number two. Number three would be, we should anticipate what would be the person asking us. Suppose if it's a Christmas season, the holiday season, we should have good knowledge about Isa alayhi salam. And uh, how do we explain about who Isa alayhi salam in Islam? So I would explain in five ways, right? First and foremost, I would explain in the, I would give give them some context. When I have to explain about Jesus, Isa alayhi salam in Islam, I would give, I would create some context and then I will introduce Isa alayhi salam in it. So I would say to them that, yes, there is a higher power, there is a creator with these wonderful attributes. And one of the attributes that he is a loving and he is a guiding creator. So for 
the love and guiding nature of for humanity god appointed messengers and prophets abraham and moses and ishmael and isaac and jesus and muhammad peace be upon all of them the third point i would mention is so jesus peace be upon him he was created or he was appointed as one of the messengers one of the prophets and he was given miracles and i will go over some of the miracles and these miracles are coming not from jesus peace be upon him but from the creator and then i would mention that some people they moved away from the message of jesus christ peace be upon him uh, which is in allah rabbi wa rabbukum fa'budu haza sirata mustaqim surah 3 ayah 51 even though isa alayhi salam said that verily allah is my lord and your lord worship him alone that is the straight path so when people moved away from the oneness of god and they diluted the oneness of god and the message and the scriptures then god appointed the final prophet muhammad peace be upon him and he was made as a universal prophet and through him god revealed the final message the final study guide for humanity which is the quran and those who take and study this study guide and do the best of their ability to follow god and to follow god's guidance then god with his mercy inshallah will induct them and graduate them and give them the reward of eternal paradise so i would introduce so again coming back right knowing the material will help us to reduce anxiety right that's number 2 number 3 would be that uh, in case if a person has really heightened anxiety there are other ways that we can still do dawa by the way do dawa through the social media we don't even have to speak a single word but we can still with our writings maybe with our videos writing the blogs or through you know facebook instagram whatsapp perhaps we can still do it you know let me just give you one example inshallah that always motivates me So, Brother Ahmed Rehab is uh, the director of uh, care in Chicago. So, about three four months ago, he he wrote a post on Facebook, and in the post he mentioned that as he was coming out of a store, he found this person distributing uh, this gain pieces one minute cards, and he took a card and he pretended that he is a non-Muslim and he started to have argument with this uh, Muslim brother. or asking questions to the muslim brother who was distributing the card and the muslim brother was peaceful and patient and you know just with a smile he just without saying too many things he kept on distributing to the people and this muslim brother he had a speech impediment by the way so what he does is he takes like literally hundreds and hundreds of cards and he says you know what this is a holiday season this is a long weekend let me take the cards from gain peace let me go to the shopping centers in front of the shopping centers let me distribute the cards that's all he does by the way right and alhamdulillah excellent response so there are many platforms that we can still use when we don't have to have uh, good communication skills or if we become anxiety if we have anxiety we can still do dawa using many many platforms inshallah but i would say that may allah make it easy for you and me and all of us so we don't have anxiety but with confidence and with the good character we keep on continuing the message inshallah i mean uh zakra khair thank you are there any non verbal cues that um that that can help us as well uh especially like like with our present our appearance and things of that nature all right so it's also important you know along with uh having a good character and suppose if somebody is uh, not uh, comfortable in speaking you know smile itself which is mm-hmm. described as a charity by prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know smile is one of those attributes of the seven attributes of highly successful people smile is one of them by the way so smiling itself is going to attract the people having a good demeanor in our our facial expressions uh the clothes that we wear obviously modest clothes clean clothes uh them not smelling bad right so all of these have also a good impact by the way on the recipient who we are conversing either on open houses 
or with our neighbors and colleagues and dava boos, street dava, all of these are equally important along with our character and along with our message. Thank you. Uh, someone asked, um, how do you avoid uh, always being on the defensive and how, how do you avoid that? So the next question is, how do you avoid always being on the defensive? Yes. Well, it's important, as I mentioned, uh, that our focus uh, should be who is the creator and the guidance. And uh, so purposely what I do in my open houses, in my open house keynote presentations, I don't go over the common misconceptions people have and replies to the misconceptions. I only mention to them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Muslims, the presence of the Muslims in the USA and the contributions that we have done. And what is the Quran? Who was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What is the way for salvation? I purposely don't mention to them the common misconceptions and the answers. In the Q&A session, I, I have them ask the questions. If they ask the questions, that's when obviously I give them the proper responses. So that is the way I usually avoid being defensive in the presentation, but in the Q&A, if they have misconceptions, obviously we need to clarify the misconceptions. So at least uh, the barrier that they may have between them and the beauty of Islam can be taken away so they can see Islam in its reality. And inshallah, with Allah's guidance, they will embrace Islam. Thanks. Um, a, another question is, um, someone is, a sister is, I mean, it's a question. It says, is it okay for women to smile as well? So the next question is, is it okay for the women to smile? Uh, I mean, obviously women can smile, but it has to be a gender specific smile, by the way. Same thing for the brothers. If I'm with a non-mehram person, doesn't matter Muslim or non-Muslim. Obviously, you need to make sure that lowering of the gaze, our facial expression, what we say, how we say, all of them are equally important, not just only for the sisters, by the way, they're equal, right? The word equal is important here. They're equally applicable also to the brothers. You know, as I mentioned last time, almost always I take my wife in uh, open houses, dawa booths, and... Uh, any public events where Muslims and non-Muslims interact. The reason is this. Suppose if I'm standing there and at a, at a dawa booth, for example, if a non-Muslim lady comes in and if she is approaching the dawa booth, I will push my wife a little bit forward so that my wife can smile at the non-Muslim lady and shake her hand and, and converse with the non-Muslim lady, right? But if a man is approaching the dawa table, she goes back and I step forward and I carry the conversation with a smile with the non-Muslim brother. So in that way, we can still be in public, but with the proper, proper etiquettes, which are equally applicable for both sisters and brothers. Thank you very much. Um... And um, sorry, one second. Okay, so I'm just going to read the question. Um, it says, uh, Christian pastor claim uh, their God, Jesus, is always a loving God by forgiving. If one, you know, if anyone accepts their religion and they claim in Islam that the God you know, in Islam, the God be loving and sometimes angry and punishing people for doing bad deeds, meaning uh, it seems like it's just. This kind of talk by their pastors can scare people from being interested in Islam. How do we counter that? Okay, so the question is, our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, sometimes they have the perception or they may ask the question, that, you know, in their faith of Christianity, God is a loving God. But when they look into Islam, they see God as a God 
who is punishing people, right? So how do we how do we properly respond respond to that kind of false perception of their faith and of our faith, by the way? So what I would say to them is, I would go over the attribute of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that He is just and He is merciful, and He is also punishing of the people, right? So all of them are equally important for a balanced uh, for a for a creator to have these attributes in their balance. If any one of the attributes, if it's taken into extreme, that's when you know the proper checks and balances would not be there for humanity and humanity's guidance. So what do I mean by that? Suppose if God is all loving and God is loving humanity and the creation with unconditional love, that means he's going to forgive the sinner doesn't matter what they do, even if they die with that sin. So if you take this first option, the first scenario, that God has unconditional love and no punishment for anybody. So we should, we should ask the person, the Christian brother who may be asking this question is, why would a person stay away from harm, stay away from any ill or any sin if he or she knows that God is going to forgive that person regardless of what they do. You know, just like take the example of a classroom. Why would I wake up in the morning and go to the class and take the test and do the assignment if I know that God, that the teacher is going to give me an A plus grade regardless? So God is, God's love is not uh, unconditional. God's love is conditional by the way, right? So in Islam, God's love is conditional. Even in Christianity, there is a concept of punishment. There's also a hellfire. You know, lakes and lakes of fire is mentioned even in the New Testament, by the way. So if the New Testament God is the same as the Old Testament God. In the Old Testament, there is punishment, sacrificial system, you know, wars. All of them are there in the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, just like it is there in the Quran. So what I say to the to the Christian especially is that unlike Christianity in which unlike Christianity in which a person has to pay for the sins or Jesus paid for the sins, there is no forgiveness. But in Islam there is forgiveness. Means if a person sincerely comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know I have made this mistake. I did so many wrong things. Allah, please forgive me. And if the person does it without any mediator, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed the person. Not guaranteed, by the way, but at least the door is open that do not despair the mercy of Allah. And also in Surah 4, verse number 116 says that Allah is willing to forgive all the sins except one sin, which is associating partners, shirk. So I would turn the tables and say that in Islam, Allah is more forgiving, more merciful, by sincere repentance, nobody has to die for us, unlike Christianity, in which there is no forgiveness unless the price is paid. So, so la lastly, Brother Azad, what I mentioned to my Christian friends is, in a nice way, by the way, right? Because our focus is not to debate on the topic, but to bring them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what I mentioned to them is, I give them this simple analogy. That me as a parent, so I have three children, Suppose if two of my boys, if one of my boys, suppose if he eats, he ate like, you know, four cookies, by the way, chocolate chip cookies, which they love so much. I don't like that because it's not good for their health. It's got, it's not good for their teeth, too much sugar in there, which itself, itself is not good. But if I found them eating like that, suppose me as a dad, if I keep on slapping them and hitting them for every single wrong thing that they did. I would not be the best dad. I would not be a wise dad. I would not be a forgiving dad. Compared to suppose if I see my child eating the four cookies, I mentioned, you know, Ibrahim, that's not good for you. Come on, man, that's not good for you. It's not good for your health. This body is a blessing that Allah has given. Make sure that you brush your teeth, but next time don't uh, eat, you know, more than one cookie. And if I hug Ibrahim and I say, you know what, just be careful next time. Just don't do it, you know, Ibrahim. It's not good for you. So that is a loving, forgiving parent 
knowing the fact that if the child acknowledges that what they have done and they are sincere in saying, you know, Abuji, yeah, I will not eat Abuji. I'm really sorry. Yeah, I'll be careful next time. So this second example is the example of what Islam is, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person is sincere in repentance, Allah will forgive, inshallah. But unlike in Christianity, I would say to the Christians that a price has to be paid. So where is the forgiveness? Where is the mercy? At least in Islam, a person, it's self-accountability. Nobody dies for us. No animal has to be sacrificed for our sins. Just by sincerely repenting, inshallah, Allah will forgive. So Islam is the most forgiving, the most merciful faith if these criteria are met by a human being. Jazakallah khair. Thanks. If you have any closing remarks, inshallah, and then you can uh, close out. Okay, alhamdulillah. So it's, it's really important. Uh, regardless of any shortcomings that I have, you have, Muslim Ummah have, these shortcomings should never stop us from doing dawah. I should never say to myself, you know what? I have done so many sins. I'm still doing so many sins. Let me stop doing those sins or let me make my character even better and better and better. And then I will come and start doing dawah. But that day may never happen, by the way. Despite all the shortcomings, we still have to convey the message. And I always say, you know, especially when I see this politics in the masjid, the politics in the masjid or the shortcoming of a person should not deprive the non-Muslims from the beauty of Islam. So we keep on making ourselves better, following the Quran and looking into the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and bettering our speaking skills, our patience, our credibility in the society. And we simultaneously, we convey the message. So both, you know, it's an example of a two wheels of a bicycle. Both have to be there for a bicycle to run smoothly, right? Especially for, the, for normal people. So both our self tarbiya has, has to continue and our dawah and our activism has to continue simultaneously. It's not either or, it's both simultaneously. We better ourselves as we convey the message of Islam. You know, ju just look at the Christian missionaries. There are 53,000 Christian missionaries are created each year in the USA and they are sent out to our countries, the Muslim countries to convert our people. They don't have this excuse that, you know what, let's make Christians better. Let's stop all the crimes done in the, in the USA by the so-called Christians. You know, the 40,000 suicides, the 45,000 drunk driving accidents, the 93,000 rapes, uh, the 7.6 million, uh, you know, assaults uh, on the spouses. They're not waiting for all of the ills of the society to disappear before they do the missionary work. No, with all the baggage that they have, they're still doing the missionary work. What about us, right? When people have so much heated discussion about, you know, Pakistan and Afghanistan and Burma and all of that, Allah protect all the people, all the Muslims. I mean, we cannot, we don't want to exhaust our time and energy in discussing countries. Yes, we should do the war, but if we cannot change situation in suppose some foreign country, that should not stop us from doing what we need to do locally in the USA. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala improve us, our character, our aqidah, our patience, Amen. and give us more knowledge and ease, help us to overcome the many challenges that we face here and around the country. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and save and give patience to the Muslim ummah, give us the honor, the power, and the success around the world. Amen. and in the hereafter Amen. and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help the Muslim Ummah especially in the USA to become the ambassadors of Islam to the people of USA and around the world Amen. Amen. Jazakallah khairan everyone assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah uh, and Dr. Saab uh, just to uh, mention that uh, next week you will be uh, giving the presentation again and the topic will be uh, uh, how to convey this message in five to seven minutes yeah, so inshallah, so, next, uh, next next week I will be back inshallah, and we can take more questions. Uh, the main topic uh, inshallah of uh, the next week is 
if we only have a short time with our colleagues or neighbors or friends and classroom or dava booth in a really short time how do you have the most impact with the best message awesome. so how to convey the message of islam in five minutes is the next week's topic inshallah i will see all of you jazakallah khairan thank you حانك اللهم وبحمدك ونشهد الله إله إلا أنت ونستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته